Holly Score, in conjunction with Shaw University, introduces. Are you ready to start your own business? We are excited to have you join us on this 13-week journey. Our goal is to provide you with a consistent message and a solid methodology. Our approach is simplistic in nature. Therefore, we believe if you are committed and willing to do the work, you will come away from this program confident that your business plan is solid. This week's session is dedicated to allowing four participants an opportunity to showcase their business plans to the team. We are excited for each of them, and we are hoping that you gain additional insight into the process through their efforts. Please find a quiet space and be prepared to take copious notes. If you have any questions, please email them to patty.williams at scorevolunteer.org. Enjoy the training. Well, let me just um, start by saying a big thank you to the SCORE team of volunteers for a terrific 12 weeks. I have to tell you that this course has surpassed all of my expectations. It's connected me to resources that I never dreamed of. Um, and uh, so thank you. And thanks to the rest of you for giving me this opportunity to share the work that my team and I have done to date. This is still a work in progress, but um, let me tell you just a little bit about our startup company called Thrive. So Thrive is a woman-owned lifestyle medicine telehealth practice addressing the needs of adults with or at risk for chronic medical conditions, things like diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, uh, with a particular focus on women's health and providing personalized evidence-based care that guides and supports changes in nutrition, sleep, physical activity, and emotional well-being. Delivered by registered dietitians and advanced practice providers, that's nurse practitioners and PAs, and serving North Carolina with an initial strong footprint in the Research Triangle region. Our team has over 30 years of combined experience uh, I'm the medical director, and I have served as the medical director for a lifestyle practice um, for several years. And prior to that was the medical director for a hospital-based medical fitness facility um, uh, for about 20 years. Um, I'm currently a site PI for an NIH-funded clinical trial called WECAN, which stands for Weight Loss and Exercise for Patients with Arthritis in North Carolina. And this is in collaboration with my colleagues at UNC Chapel Hill and Wake Forest. I'm a diplomat of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and a diplomat of the American Board of Obesity Medicine. Um, our operations director has been the, is a master's level trained registered dietitian and has been the lead dietitian in a lifestyle medicine practice for over seven years and also is a diplomat of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and our marketing director, also a master's trained level registered dietitian, has worked in a lifestyle medicine practice for five years and during that time was our lead in the marketing department. So to understand our market, I want to tell you just a little bit, first of all, about lifestyle medicine. Lifestyle medicine is a relatively new um, specialty in medicine. The American Board of Lifestyle Medicine was created in 2004 and began to certify people in 2017. So it's um, a specialty that is new, but very exciting. And there's lots of enthusiasm about um, this approach to healthcare. Um, <clears throat> that is in part built on the understanding and the recognition that if we're going to address the main conditions that threaten our society and the obesity epidemic, that we have to have, help people make um, sustainable long-term changes in behavior um, that are lifestyle-based. And that it is possible, uh, there's very exciting increasing evidence that it is possible to reverse some of our most serious chronic conditions, including coronary artery disease and diabetes by embracing lifestyle change. And to do that without the use of medications or surgery, which are the tools that we have relied on um, to manage these conditions. Um, I also want to um, <clears throat> give credit to the importance of the Affordable Care Act, which mandated that uh, commercial insurers provide coverage for preventative services. So this has laid the foundation to do the kind of work that we do in lifestyle medicine um, because it is wrapped up in, in healthcare as we know it in our country now. 
Um, <clears throat> our comprehensive approach, <clears throat> pardon me, is different from what you would get from a commercial weight loss program. Commercial weight loss programs are usually short-term programs and they use <clears throat> medications and food products to, um, to assist clients. We are also different than bariatric surgery centers where there is often medical um, intervention available and medical weight loss um, services, <clears throat> excuse me, but they are often rely on anti-obesity medicines. Um, there are many individual boutique practices, but they tend to be um, single focused, for instance, on plant-based diet or wellness coaching and often are self-pay. And to be truthful, it's usually primary care providers who have been most um, excited about lifestyle medicine, but it's much more challenging for them to integrate this kind of care into a standard um, prim primary care practice because of the lack of time and also the support and sophistication of other team members. Um, our market is robust because there are, particularly in this region, a large number of commercially insured individuals. For example, Blue Cross Blue Shield State Health Plan, which does provide um, reimbursement for the care that we provide, covers over 700,000 lives in the state of North Carolina, many of which are here in the research uh, Raleigh-Durham-Chapel Hill area. Um, and there are a large number of referring physicians, over 1,200 um, that we um, see as potential partners um, as we deliver lifestyle services. <clears throat> so what are some of the threats that we um, uh, face and, um, and also the opportunities that um, we um, can um, take advantage of? Well, first of all, it's um, distinguishing ourselves from these competitors. How do we get the word out that we are different, that we have much um, uh, more in-depth training and, and uh, understanding of the field um, as um, really uh, a marketing challenge for us? And we have a number of ways that we intend to do that to, to help uh, individuals become aware that coverage is available and that what we have to offer is unique. Um, a major threat would be if we were to lose coverage for telehealth services, which um, many of you may recognize have been adopted by health insurance companies during the pandemic and embraced by patients and providers alike. Um, we believe that that's unlikely, but that is a possibility in which case we would have to uh, shift our services to in-person encounters, but would try to do that in partnership with medical practices, um, providing our services embedded in a practice or at employment sites. And we have done both of those things um, in our previous work experience um, already. It's also possible that we could lose the coverage of the Affordable Care Act. As many of you know, that's been um, <clears throat> threatened and um, the mandate then to provide preventative services would be lost and we would have to switch our, our care model around uh, to make more use of providers who can charge under regular insurance um, using what we refer to as ENM coding rather than prevention coding. And then there's the impact of COVID, which has been a roller coaster and a little bit hard to um, predict, but we feel like in general, COVID has been um, a benefit for us because it's pushed forward the technology uh, of virtual visits. And it has also helped patients jump on board much faster than they otherwise would have. Um, and when it does threaten our ability to market our services and we recognize that when we can't be face-to-face, -face, it is somewhat harder um, to, um, to do the marketing that we're accustomed to. So there are potential competitors. Um, we'll try to distinguish ourselves, but the primary competitor that we face is a single existing company in this region that does deliver lifestyle medicine uh, using registered dietitians and advanced practice providers. Our um, products um, are different in many ways from the services offered by this company. So it's um, 
um, one of our challenges is again to uh, help folks understand how we are different. Uh, we are more personalized. We um, offer long-term support. We will be working not only with individuals, but groups because the power of the group in helping folks with behavior change is significant. And probably most important of all is that we are very committed to the robust use of technology, um, using remote monitoring technology to stay engaged with our patients, not only with our regular visits, but the soft touches that occur in between by monitoring weights, blood pressures, blood, blood sugar values that are transmitted to us and having small interactions uh, and offering encouragement and support to those people who join us as clients. Um, as I've mentioned already, we think that our strengths are significant. In addition to the things that I've already mentioned, I'll show you in a second <clears throat> that we do have a very, <clears throat> sorry, very low overhead and, and we do have a strong commitment to the use of technology. <clears throat> so how are we gonna find customers? What's our strategy? We um, have been working on a very strong plan for our social media presence um, uh, with uh, the folks on our team, as well as some um, consultants. Um, we also have um, a unique opportunity to launch our business in what we are referring to as a soft launch. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second, but um, that will give us an opportunity to really um, roll out and test a lot of our, um, our plans. Um, we definitely will build relationships with our referring providers and with the primary providers of patients who self-refer um, because we know that that's um, a clear avenue to future referrals. We've identified multiple niche markets that we um, have the capacity to serve where lifestyle care is critical to a unique illness um, and um, where there are a small set of providers that we can, can serve uniquely. We also are developing a membership model for folks who don't have health insurance benefits so they can afford our services. And we uh, will work hard in the first year of our practice to um, establish the reputation to be considered a high value specialist um, in a local affordable care organization. So what are our goals and objectives? I mentioned the soft launch already. We will have six months when one member of our team, one of our registered dietitians will begin to practice not branded as Thrive, but still using all of our tools, which will allow us to really um, um, evaluate our technology and, um, and build our processes and um, um, develop um, our patient support materials uh, in a way that we would uh, not uh, have if we jumped in with both feet. And beginning then six months from that soft launch, um, I will join and the other registered dietitian will join and we will move into a growth phase where our hope is that we will continue to build our capacity. So at the end of that six to 12 month period of time, we will be ready to add additional providers to our team. Um, and during that growth phase, we are um, uh, intent on serving the community um, here in the Research Triangle Park and folks that live within an hour of RTP. Um, as our primary focus. During the expansion phase, uh, our intention is to continue to build our staff uh, so that we can um, serve the state of North Carolina. And with telehealth, that's very possible to do. Um, we've had experience with that and have learned um, that um, it's um, uh, certainly a doable thing, but does require that we have um, uh, stability and uh, continue to develop our staff. Um, so it's at this point in time that we hope we have um, acquired um, the resources to um, do that, that we have repaid the investments that we made um, on the launch of our um, company and um, have um, been able to um, build an operating reserve. Um, 
Finally, we hope that we will eventually be able to move into a leadership and innovation phase. Uh, we have ideas about potentially developing the capacity to train primary care providers who really do want to do lifestyle medicine in their practice um, and get involved in e-publishing and other things that would help promote uh, what we believe is a really important change in healthcare um, delivery. So this is um, an illustration of our um, expenses that uh, we anticipate um, we will be facing um, during our launch phase. Um, let me just say that I'm pleased that we will not have to um, look beyond our own resources to launch the company. So although we wanna be rigorous in um, understanding um, our financial situation, our plans and projections, um, it's not our intent right now that we're going to have to raise money. Um, so um, there are some things that are front loaded are um, gonna invest in our marketing and setting up our legal and accounting um, in the beginning. So those expenses are greater during this very first soft launch period. Um, and then we have identified costs uh, for additional uh, startups. So um, this still is a less than $10,000 investment um, to get us up and going. Um, our operating expenses will include technology, our electronic health record, platforms for our remote monitoring um, and telehealth, as well as internet and phone and, um, and those basic services. When we go into our um, full launch, the other thing that escalates is our malpractice insurance. Um, but um, luckily this is not um, a field where risks are high and um, we can cover all of the employees under the umbrella policy that I will be um, paying. So what you can see is that um, the um, monthly um, overhead for our for our, the three of us starting is at a very reasonable level. Um, now the revenue side of this is a much more complicated thing to walk you through and certainly beyond this presentation. But let me just explain that there are a number of assumptions. We, we initially will just be making money based on delivering patient care. We have other strategies as I've mentioned already for uh, rate, making money down life's road, but um, and that our target market will be the commercially insured. Um, we can serve Medicare patients and we would love to embrace Medicare patients, but the truth is Medicare does not reimburse for prevention services uh, of the type that we um, um, uh, receive from commercial payers. Um, so um, we also have knowledge because of our work in this field about what the typical coding and reimbursements um, uh, have been. And so we were able to arrive at reimbursement um, predictions for 15 minute increments of times, both for the registered dietitian and clinicians, and also have estimated um, not only the hours of patient care per week, but our efficiency at max and our collections, which again in this field um, are high um, because of the limited number of codes and uh, differences in charge types. Um, we're also blessed that the leadership team um, that we will be starting with has the capacity to gradually increase their salary over the first 12 months um, because of other um, streams of revenue in their family um, and, um, uh, and additional support. So um, if our model is, per, is a does predict, um, um, and if our first three employees are meeting their efficiency goals and the collections are as predicted, and there's no change in these fee schedules that I have mentioned, then we should be able to meet our overhead expenses, our salary goals, and fund um, the support and training of additional new employees by the end of our first 18 months. Um, and to be uh, entirely honest, we are right in the middle right now of um, working out the details of our employment model. Um, so what we would need to grow, how we would um, add additional people and, um, and the uh, types of agreements to consider uh, when we add people to our team. 
So what are the risks? The risks are that we don't get back our initial financial investments or um, we don't recoup the uh, income loss that we had during uh, the startup phase, um, that there is a, a reduction, the reimbursement for these services that we believe are so vital and hopefully will survive. Um, or if we were to lose uh, key team members in the um, first initial three years of startup. Um, the rewards are that we would meet and exceed our income goals and maintain work-life balance. I don't know if you noticed when I, we talked about um, the hours of work, we all hope to um, aim for 32 hours a week um, because of our strong commitment to work-life balance. Um, and most importantly, for all three of us, this is a really important opportunity to have impact on the health of our community and to really try and move, um, be a part of what we know is um, a, a foot in our country, which is really moving healthcare forward, not sick care. So where are we right now? The, the key issues that we have in the midst of finalizing are um, we're uh, working on insurance contracting and credentialing for the soft launch, uh, finalizing our choice of a telehealth and remote monitoring platform. We've already acquired an electronic health record. We're completing all of our legal documents and do intend to trademark our name and logo and processes. Um, it's really not long-term, it's really sort of midterm um, to continue modeling for growth uh, in terms of uh, both employees and other service lines and to make decisions about um, our goals for reinvestment in the company. And as you all have suggested, to really look carefully at goals and triggers for uh, the potential sale of the company and have that conversation early on. So that's, that's uh, where we are with Thrive and I'd be delighted to answer any, any questions you all might have. That was a great job. Great job. Fantastic. Yes, very, very, excellent. very thorough. Yes. Extremely thorough. I think what I like, Kate, was the large budget that you allocated to marketing. And that is excellent for you to do that right up front. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times people start a business and they don't even think about that. They just get things going and they don't really allocate what it's really going to take to get their name out there. So that really stuck out to me as really a great feature. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, um, I think it was very informative. It was very clear. I, I have two thoughts and that is uh, you did, I think a really clear job of identifying uh, your threats and risks. Um, and I think it creates the opportunity to uh, think through how you'll mitigate those risks and those threats and, and what the contingencies are um, if, the, if the intended goals, you know, your performance against those goals isn't as strong as is indicated, uh, what your contingencies would be. Uh, but I think you, I think the way you laid your plan out, it creates a great basis for you all to be able to ask and answer those questions very effectively. I appreciate, you know, your efforts to help us really think through those mitigation strategies. And I think that's going to be an ongoing um, exercise as we move forward. And thank you for that, Bill. Dr. Queen, I, this is Dr. Angie. I'm impressed by the strengths that you have, um, your ability to articulate about your industry, um, some of the word choices that you used around wellness, like well, well care versus sick care. Um, I find that appealing. Um, your company name, Thrive, which was my word for the year, by the way, um, <laughs> is very appealing at a time when work-life balance is so critical um, so it's, it's very um, thoughtful, um, very provocative, and um, I see success in store for you guys. I love how you tie in the telemedicine and the advancement that COVID gave us um, to be so tech savvy and to make it okay. Um, you know, I, I'll openly share, I, um, I experienced COVID 
um, a few weeks back. And um, through telemedicine, I was able to, actually my doctors checked on me daily uh, during that process. It was so comforting. I see a whole new world of opportunity for you and your, your partners and team. So I'm encouraging you to just go for it. And what I like best in your plan is the soft launch and the opportunity to do some process documentation. That's very impressive. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, just, we are so blessed that everything has come together and there is a silver lining on a lot of these clouds. And, and for us, this is really a special time to be able to move. You know, it's interesting. I, I come from the diabetes industry. Um, and so there's always been kind of talk around, you know, prevention because I was on the after you are diagnosed piece. And, and we used to say that if somebody could solve the upfront piece, then we would all happily go out of business, you know, and, and, you know, that's, that's, you said silver lining, you know, and certainly I tell people, none of us wanted a pandemic to accelerate certain things or, or have kind of positive impacts, but, but there has been some, and one of the ones that I've been watching is the trend around telemedicine, because that was a conversation that we would have in diabetes. And we would say, if we could just leverage, if you would just allow reimbursement, if you would allow um, educators to be able to meet with people in rural areas, if, you know, don't make them get in a car, don't make them get on a bus, you know, meet them where they're at. Um, and seeing the exponential growth of telemedicine and then the Affordable Care Act being able to, you know, uh, handle uh, or provide the reimbursement, right, for, for um, risk prevention and things like that, you know, um, are silver linings. And I hope that we uh, now as a society have embraced those things. And if we have, and the policies stay, then you are on the, the leading edge of that trend. And um, I think you'll, you'll be very successful in that. So great presentation and um, well done. Thank you for having the courage Thank to you. present tonight. Yeah, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, the tools that we now have. There's something called um, continuous glucose monitoring or CGS, yep. which are tools that patients can wear. And I can have on my dashboard that patient's blood sugar shown continuously. And the aha moments that happen for them when they can see what happens to their blood sugar when they eat this or do that. It's, I mean, it's an entire game changer in the world of diabetes. And it is really possible to help people see that if they don't eat this before they go to bed, they won't have that blood sugar in the morning. And um, so, yeah, it's a very exciting time um, with these tools. And, and Kate, the only thing I wanted to add is exactly what you just did, is you brought it to a practical why it's so important you know, down to the, this, this is how it'll actually change people's lives. Cause that was very compelling what you just described. So is there, if there's a way you can fold those kinds of anecdotes into your presentation to make it real, I think mm -hmm. it would make it even more powerful. Thank you. Yeah, you definitely showed how you are different and how you are set apart from other companies and what you offer and how you offer it. That's really important. Because people, there's plenty of people that may be doing it, but the thing that sets you apart is that. And that was so, so very good. I just, I totally agree with Sharon. Yeah. Okay, well, well Dr. Kate, thank, thank you so much yeah. for bringing us this subject. It's been very popular. Everybody's, everybody got it. So we <laughs> may be able to come back to you later, but we need to move on. So Jay, yep. Yeah, next up we have uh, Rita with Narrowway Expressions. Okay, good evening, everyone. I will go ahead and get started with my presentation. I would like to introduce you to Narrow Way Expressions. So Narrow Way Expressions, the business concept, it's a faith-based creative arts production company providing entertainment through stage plays. The stage play, it's a play that I wrote, Unbelieve, and it's about um, a woman who struggles with abortion. Uh, narrow way expressions, the attention is to bring forth awareness to the advocacy and level of support needed for women who have made the decision, the tough decision to have an abortion. After the performance is over, there will be a talk back Q&A session where I will invite partners from the community. 
the team, it's me. I am the CEO, founder, and executive producer. I have over 16 years of experience in the entertainment business. I've worked as a background um, talent for TV shows and movies in Wilmington, North Carolina, and Hollywood, California. I have performed as an actress at Fayetteville State University, Bronco Pride, and North Carolina Central University, Go Eagles. I've served in drama ministries as an actress and a drama director at churches. I've also assisted locally backstage as a dresser working with costumes in the costume shop at North Carolina Theater and Durham Performing Arts Center, DPAC. Additionally, as an executive producer, it's, it's extremely important for me to know how to operate spreadsheets. So I have over five years of experience in contracts and grants, budget management. Um, there we go. Our target market for Unbelieve, it's adolescents and women ranging from ages 15 and up of all races, education, occupation, and income. According to CDC, in 2016, there were 11.6 abortions per 1,000 women aged 15 to 44 year, years old. That's why the target market is ages 15 and up for women. Some st statistics, one in three women have been touched by the pain and loss of abortion. Nine out of 10 of those women don't know where to go for healing after an abortion. SWAT, our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I'll start with the strengths. As I mentioned before, my experience with budget management, um, it, the strength is that it's a unique topic. Also, the talkback Q&A session, we don't, we don't see that often in performances. My network with local theaters and drama ministries, I consider that to be a strength. And the fact that I am a woman who has had an abortion, who can relate to women. Um, at the age of 19, about 18 years ago, I had an abortion and struggled for about 18 years with the decision that I made. So the fact that I can relate to other women who've made that tough decision, I find as a strength. Weaknesses, it's um, candid topics that may not be received well. I have limited experience as a producer, so therefore not much credibility. Also, I've only written one play so far, so we have limited content right now. However, our opportunities, um, other playwrights may reach out and want their work produced if, if their work is in line with our mission. Also, another opportunity is that I can partner with local organizations that offer post-abortive support or churches, organizations like that. Additionally, um, local theaters or churches may reach out wanting the play to be performed at their venue. Another opportunity is that diversity and inclusion is at the forefront in our nation right now. So therefore, the, the audience may lean more towards hearing my perspective as a Black female playwright. But because diversity and inclusion is at the forefront right now, that's also a threat because there could be other individuals whose voice may be, want to be heard over mine because the topics that I choose may not be um, as comfortable. So who is our competition? I have identified theater production companies in the Triangle area, such as Women's Theater Festival and the Justice Theater Project. Their uh, content is engaging and um, it, they address social concerns, but sometimes their content can come across as a little bit vulgar. You might hear, you know, the F-bomb dropped every now and then. So our competitive advantage is that our company is your family's safe space for conservative entertainment that addresses social concerns while standing on God's love and biblical truths because we are a Christian faith-based production company. We're committed to offering hope and healing through creative expressions while protecting the gateway to your soul. We know that broad is the gate, but narrow is the way. Our customer acquisition strategy. So one way to, um, to gain more clients is I intend to facilitate 26 free online meetings to discuss women's reproductive health issues, topics like abortion, 
miscarriage, infertility, domestic violence. Um, and during those meetings, I will be able to collect emails from the attendees and um, see if they would be interested in being a part of my listserv so that they can be up to date about my current and future projects. Also connecting with partners. So some, some partners that I've, I've identified include places like Gateway Women's Care who offer post-abortion post support, post support um, and they may want to share the information about the production with, with their clients. They can share that through email or on their social media platforms. Our marketing strategy is two months before each production will begin to advertise the play on social media platforms, including Facebook and Instagram, with a link to Eventbrite. Eventbrite also does a bit of advertising for you. Um, and Eventbrite is where tickets can be purchased. Additionally, two weeks before opening night, I think it would be a good idea to share sneak peek footage of the rehearsals that um, you know, can be shared on our social media platform as well. And people will be able to buy tickets through the Eventbrite link. And again, as I mentioned before, marketing. Our partners can help us to market. Goals and objectives. So when I start, I intend to start the company in January. Within the first 90 days of opening up, I will produce one run of Unbelieve, the play that I mentioned that I wrote. I intend to produce it in March of 2021. So within the first year, I intend to produce it two more times. So that's three times in one year. And I'm in communication with my church about producing it there first. The three-year goal is to produce Unbelieve and other plays by other playwrights at larger venues, such as um, Garner Performing Arts Center, Holly Springs Cultural Center, or local theaters. And then we may even have a team built and put the shows on the road. Resources. Personnel, it takes people to put on a show. It takes a lot of people. It takes the playwright, the director, the producer, stage managers, people to do hair and makeup, costumes. It takes a lot to put on the magic that you see on stage. Finances, um, these people wanna be paid. So we need to have salaries for them. It also costs to rent a venue, um, preferably places that have lighting and sound already included. We need um, funds to purchase merchandise. I intend to sell t-shirts and journals online as well as at the event. Journals are important to me because one way that I personally got through my healing was to journal about the, about the, the stress and depression that I felt that I was going through. That's how I wrote Unbelieve, just journaling. And so I think um, it, it would be a great idea to, to sell journals also to people distribution. We will have a video version of the play on Vimeo. Eventbrite is the way that I mentioned before where tickets will be sold. And I also intend to have a Narrow Way Expressions website. Promotion, social media, of course, um, Instagram and Facebook so far is what I intend to use. Eventbrite, like I mentioned before, email, collecting those emails. People still do check emails. Um, printed materials such as posters and flyers and word of mouth. That's a great way to promote uh, a play. The products, as I mentioned before, t-shirts and the journals. I'll use lulu.com. Um, the t-shirts and journals will have inspirational quotes on them. The services that we're providing is naturally the performances that people see, the entertainment, um, the free workshops. I intend to use Zoom. And uh, another service is the liaison service, which is connecting individuals with those partners. So part of that Q&A that I talked about, um, those partners or organizations can come to the play and afterwards be a part of the Q&A session, but also have an information table set up so that individuals who might need their services can go and communicate with them, or there may be people who want to volunteer or donate.
our financial plan. And I'll kind of go over this quickly. There's a lot of information. I projected a three year, um, three year sales and revenue for the first year at the church, the second year a community center, and the third year maybe at Garner Performing Arts Center. So we'll have um, ticket sales, video sales, and merchandise. That's how we'll bring in revenue. And I know this is a lot of information, um, so I won't stay on here too long, but basically those resources that I talked about earlier, they're all included here. And I'll just pause here for a moment just for you to glance over it. I'm not gonna go too much into detail. I was trying to go to that bottom line figure, but I went to the next slide. So, okay, so this one is just a snapshot of our revenue and operating expenses over the next three years. And as you see, we're in the black. So we're making a profit each year based off of my calculations. Risks and rewards. Well, naturally we're still in a pandemic right now um, and social distancing will still be in place by the time I put on the first production. Um, the church that I attend, it can naturally, it can normally hold about 300 people at one time, but because we are operating under reduced capacity, the, the, the maximum amount is about 90 for right now. So that means that I'll be able to sell less tickets that I, than I would normally be able to sell. But the reward or the flip side, the positive of that is I hadn't initially intended to do a video version of the play. So because um, I can't sell a lot of in-person tickets, we'll, we'll intend to sell videos. And the great thing about that is that we can reach more people than um, people in the triangle area. Um, social and, his, and historical risk and rewards, well, the obvious one is criticism because of the topic that I mentioned. It is um, very candid and people feel, you know, it's a polarized topic. But the reward is that is that there could be policies or organizations that may emerge. I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with Eve Ensler. I believe it's in the late 90s. She wrote a play called The Vagina Monologues and um, it received a lot of criticism, but on the flip side of that, the positive is that a nonprofit organization came forth because of the play that she wrote. So it could be something similar for Unbelieve. Key issues, near term, the financial impact on narrow way expressions, acquiring a line of credit for startup expenses. If, um, if I don't acquire those funds, then I wouldn't be able to pay the deposits um, on the venue location. And that just postponing it will mean that instead of doing three productions in one year, I may be only able to do two or one, which will decrease the amount of revenue that could come in. The long term, I looked at it at a social impact on society. These topics have been silenced, kept secret, and swept under the rug. Stigmas and shame have caused stress, pain, and even depression in women. And like I said, I can attest to that because I, I was that way. I felt depression for many years based off of the, the decision that I made. I know that's not everyone's story, but that is my story. Um, struggles in women's reproductive health should not be carried around as if they are secrets meant to destroy. And then I leave with the question, how much longer shall we remain silent about this social concern? So that concludes my presentation. These are different ways that you can connect with me, Facebook, Instagram, or Gmail. I want to shout out SCORE and thank all of you for your support and encouragement and just guidance. I've learned so much in a short amount of time and I just really appreciate everyone. Um, do we have time, uh, Patty, for some questions? There are a couple in the um, chat. Yes, okay. we can take a few minutes. So one question for you, Rita, um, from Dr. Cheryl is, do you have psychologists and therapists 
as part of your team as you develop other plays to make sure critical themes are engaged? I do not. I've only communicated with um, a post-supportive, a post-abortion supportive group. So that's that's someone that I would need to add to my team psychologist. So thank you for that question and recommendation. Okay, and then from Dr. Cheryl, might also a threat be fear of their own sexuality in general and about reproductive choices in particular? So I think she was just raising it as something for you to consider. Mm -hmm. um, I'll repeat it. Might also a threat be fear of their own sexuality in general and about reproductive choices in particular um, was a comment. And then she went on to say the term conservative is so loaded mm -hmm. and means different things for different people. Might there be an adjective that would work better and not smack um, of overtly politics. Usually we have a lot of anti-abortion mm -hmm. organizations uh, who feel uh, very strongly about their positions, I think is where she's going. But she also added, what a great contribution and much needed. Um, I would have to agree as a coach, um, I have talked to a number of women uh, when you think about self-esteem and where they are um, still holding that guilt and blame and shame and depression that may not have, have been healed. Um, and then there's a, a last question. Is there a way to live stream your presentation or play and have people purchase virtual tickets? I think that's something that you might consider in, in today's world. I know I was gonna do the Vimeo. I'm not sure if I'm gonna do the live stream or not, but it's something that I can consider. Mm -hmm. But Vimeo right. does offer virtual tickets. Yeah, in terms of feedback on the plan, I think you've got a really a clear plan, Rita. The, the place I would challenge you is around your rate of expansion. Um, I, if, if you get the business up and going, I think you have an opportunity to find that you get out around the third year that, that, that you, can, you can find opportunities to expand more than your current financial projections uh, project, because you want you want to get you really want to get on top of it, so to speak. And so, I think you got an opportunity to do other than what I'm going to call marginal growth. Uh, if you get through that first year and the things work like you've laid out and they work like you lay out in the second year, I think the third year can be more ambitious. Okay. Also, Rita, I think this is one where you really ought to be ready to adapt and rewrap in case you need to do that with this story, because it may be more palatable if you put it inside some other story and it just sort of emerges as a central focus then that may carry it a little bit further because when you when you come at it like you like you have done some people may not even show up mm -hmm. and so you you want everyone to show up you indicated that so you can start it however you would like to do that but just be open to keeping your concept your core and maybe wrapping using your artistic ability to, to broaden that and wrap some other story in with it and still carry your theme throughout the presentation. You following me? I think so. I'm not one of the experts, but I'd like to add one thing that I wrote a comment for too, and you can always contact me. I saw a play done through Triad Stage here in Greensboro it was nationwide. It was a murder mystery, eight characters. Everything was on Zoom. It was $50 a ticket for if you wanted to individually watch it at home and $200 a ticket if you wanted to watch it on TV in a lounge in a cafe. So you can always contact me, Pam Ashton, if you'd like to know more about that. Thank you. That's cool. I like that. That's like outside of the box thinking right there. Um, and one thing um, I wanted to say really quickly is because this, this business, this work is so personal to you, 
as you go through it, you're going to get a lot of feedback, a lot of input, a lot of opinions. You want to kind of make sure that you're shoring up your inner resources with routines and practices that continue to keep you grounded and clear um, and also have people around you who can continue to energize you and uplift you. So you, you don't want to have put that in place when you need it. You want to kind of have it in place from the beginning and just know that because this work is so personal, it's going to be uncomfortable and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, I guess kind of in line, like, you know, the, I think about the heroes or people that I consider heroes and, and at least kind of in my lifetime and that have made true change. And they're the ones that were able to stand in an uncomfortable place and take it and absolutely take it. I think of like Muhammad Ali, Doc, you know, Dr. King, others, right, that knew that they were putting themselves out there. But mm -hmm. to Sharon's point, we're ready. <laughs> Because they knew that, you know, pe 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 parts of society were going to come after them, people were going to come after them. They knew that they had this mission. And, um, you know, Rita, you've been, you know, real active in, in, in all of the sessions, right? And even in, you know, in Bill's sessions and then, you know, sending uh, your business case and stuff to, to us. And, and I, I personally have seen that strength and mission in, in what you've seen me and the interactions in there. And so I agree with Sharon, you know, be ready because you're going to be one of those heroes, right? Where um, you're going to stand and you're going to have to be able to take it, but that's also going to inspire people to make change. So, um, you know, I was excited to see, uh, excited to see what you've been building since the beginning. And, and I think, you know, this is really good feedback that you've gotten from the group. And this is kind of what we wanted to see, right? You know, we want you guys to support each other, not just here, but then when all of you kind of graduate from this, reach out and share ideas so that you're all stronger together. And um, I think it's going to be amazing to watch, Rita. So. I job. love that, Rita. I'll just close with it's a very compelling story. And what I like about it is it is a it's an uncomfortable conversation. And um, I think timing is great um, in a society where people are starting to be so much less judgmental and more accepting of meeting people where they are. So hats off to you. Um, you definitely came off very confidently and knowledgeable about uh, your vision and your plan. So I would say plan your work and work your plan and, and know that you can go and grow at the same time. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Sure. Thank you. All right. So next up, we have uh, Catherine McKinley and uh, Signet Leadership Group, LLC. Okay, great. I am here. Sorry, I thought there was one more ahead of me. So let me get my presentation up here. <laughs> so we had somebody um, had to drop for personal reasons, oh. just, just poor class. So apologize. No, no worries. Okay, I have very tough acts to follow, but I'm going to try my best. Um, let me see here if I can do the sharing thing. You did it, yay. Right. It's sharing properly though. <laughs> yes, we see it. You see it? Okay. Yes. All right, cool. Well, in 10 minutes or less, I'm gonna tell you about Signet Leadership Group. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I am an engineer by education. I work in banking and finance and I'm a planner. So trying to keep it high level in 10 minutes was a challenge, but let's, let's get started and see how we do. <laughs> I've got three slides for you. I'm gonna give you an overview of the business, talk about the three C's, clients, competitors, and costs. And then how am I gonna fill my funnel? Talk about a little bit about finances and the fundamentals of the plan. And then hopefully have some time for Q&A and feedback. Let me start my timer, because I'm a talker. Okay, so Signet Leadership Group, pop quiz. What do you think it's about? <gasps> Leadership consulting. And all of you just went, oh, Catherine, there's a thousand of those out there. I know, but bear with me. So it's really about, um, you know, advising for things like standing up a new organization. And you'd be surprised how many people, especially now within large corporations are restructuring, they're reorganizing. Um, and they, you know, you have to know how to set up structures, process, people, talent. And I've done that 
for most of my career somehow, some way. And I love it. I love to kind of create that um, uh, that turnkey organization. And I've had the opportunity to come, side along, come alongside a lot of people and do that as a consultant and in my professional roles. I also have Lean Six Sigma background, lots of business process management, process improvement, change management, risk management, project program portfolio management, all kinds of things. I've been through corporate bankruptcies and mergers and acquisitions and integrations. And really the story of my leadership consulting are all these kind of crisis and challenged and difficult situations. You know, I remember having to start a new organization and take on an established one over many different regions. We were in the middle of contentious um, uh, labor negotiations. Some of our staff was unionized. We had a new CEO. He was a top 40 under 40. He's like light and fires left, right, and center. And the whole thing was chaos. And I loved it because I'm an, I love uncertainty and coming in and bringing structure. So it's really leadership unusual for the consulting in, in this aspect. The other piece that I've done, and again, this, this is more mostly not just experience, but what, you know, do what you know and what you love. And I've been mentoring people for well over 15 years. And most of it is not, you know, finding your career path or, um, you know, a lot of the great coaching around me, there's life coaching, there's career coaching. This is very specific. The, the mentoring I do is primarily for, you know, a technical person who wants to go into a business function. And that's not as a, an easy um, shift. It's a technical person who's a subject matter expert and they wanna go into management. That's also not an easy shift. So there's very niche um, type of next level uh, progressions that I've lived um, over my 24 year career. And I've been helping people through like my professional engineering associations, you know, here at the um, STEM in the park, mentoring high school students and mentoring you know college students for over seven years um, for all of those different kinds of of pathways so signet leadership is a blend of both of those passions leadership consulting for the challenges and the unusual and the crisis and that kind of mentoring taking that and putting it into a business so i've listed some of my credentials there i've spoken to some of them as well formal consulting experience mentoring experience a lot of licenses and certifications that hopefully show that I have some credibility in this space. Um, and that in a nutshell is the overview of Signet Leadership and the person behind it. Let's move on. Clients, competitors, and costs. So the clients are really these professionals. Yeah, it can be in any industry, and I've worked in multiple industries and, and um, you know, that, that development and that skill to move forward is irrespective of, you know, oil and gas, healthcare, technology, banking, whatever it might be. And it really is that one-to-one. -one. I don't really plan to have corporate clients. Um, and in fact, I have already done a conflict of interest uh, with my uh, exercise with my current employer to make sure that I do not, um, you know, infringe on anything with my employment. Um, so I have very specific conditions not to work with competitors and things like that. So this has been presented to them. It's got their blessings. So now we're here and hopefully we'll get some good feedback from you to move forward. Competitors, as I mentioned, there's lots of them. They're large companies. There's a lot of leadership consultants. A lot of people like me who have been, you know, I, I worked at IBM for 25 years. I left, I retired. They asked me to come back and consult. So now they're doing consulting and that's all great. Mine again is very different. I've been in all these situations that are just really the things that other people don't usually like to address or don't have the experience um, to address. Not many people go through a corporate bankruptcy. Not pe many people <laughs> may have lived through the internet hype where you know the company I worked for at the time had a billion dollars of market cap and they spent like crazy and we were you know, having job fairs and hiring literally thousands of people. Um, and that's all really, you know, different stuff that, that is just not um, typically covered in leadership type of consulting. So that's my unique value proposition. Cost. So I went through, there's in, in little tiny print, there's a, a number of costs. 
when you roll it up, it's about 1500 for the first six months. And then ongoing about $100 a month while I'm home-based and online. Let's move on. So how am I gonna fill the funnel? Well, I do have a pretty extensive professional network that I can leverage, not through my employer, um, but just personally, um, because I've worked a lot of different places and, and done consulting. I have a pretty extensive network for, through all the mentoring that I've done as well. So those client engagements will be a primary source of revenue. Um, I also do public speaking and uh, mostly that's volunteer, but it's a lot of fun. And again, it's around those topics that may not normally be covered. The first topic there, motivational leadership, I did two years ago at um, the NCPMI. And they actually asked me to come back this year. And I did it, you know, motivational leadership reimagined for this world of remote work. And so things like that, I, you know, turning public speaking into a, a revenue stream, which you can do virtually, um, may, may help with some of that revenue stream. I plan to promote the business socially and through online media, primarily LinkedIn, uh, because that's where my professional presence is. But of course, I'll also set it up for the company uh, to have its own. And then do, you know, like a leadership minute, uh, either through LinkedIn or through YouTube. It's got to be a minute or less. And, you know, um, just kind of those snippets to build a presence, build brand awareness, and hopefully draw some people into the website. Community networking events. So this is super fun. I love hosting things. And um, the last one there, the Leadership Lab, I've actually done. I just, you know, rented, or didn't rent, it's no cost, here at the Frontier and RTP. You can just book a room. I put up a title, I'm like, hey, leadership in times of uncertainty and change. You know, people came and from all different industries and I gave a one hour session and it was really fun. Um, so, you know, something like that, where I can, again, build awareness and maybe get some clients who are looking for, for some help. And I did actually have requests. They're like, oh, you know, your career, how did you go from here to here? And I'm like, oh, well, you know, let's have a coffee and I'll tell you and see where you are and give you some ideas. The Leadership Live one is very cool. That one I'm very excited about. So I've been a really good leader and I've been a really bad leader. And, <laughs> you know, the, the stories about where you have not been less, you know, you've been less than stellar are really meaningful. So it's always good to, you know, we get the CEO and, you know, he did something great and the company's growing and you're like, wow, that's awesome. But it's really hard to relate to that. And then you talk to somebody else and you find out they're in a really difficult situation and they're, you know, they're reading their leadership manual and they're like, I don't know how to deal with this. And then they find out somebody else was in there. And, you know, I've had people tell me, wow, I can't believe I did that. I just made a colleague cry in a meeting, like I'm a horrible person. And, <laughs> you know, it's the other side of leadership. So the Leadership Live is an event that I want to host. You know, I know a lot of people, I've actually approached some of them, you know, like Chief Procurement Officer at IBM. I'm like, hey, would you do a 20 minute segment on something cool you're doing as a leadership, um, you know, global leadership in Ireland? I saw something he posted. So I bring somebody like that in, but I'd also have the really fun part, which I would call like Leadership Unhinged or Leadership Exposed and some brave souls, you know, beforehand would um, sign up and, and it's, you know, five or 10 minutes about when they did not have such a, a good leadership moment. Um, and I've done that before in other informal things and people just love that. It's really authentic and it's really real and the networking is amazing. Like people just become real. They don't become the resume. Um, the other nice thing I like doing about those events is, and I would do it for this as well, is when you host those events, you get to support your favorite charities and causes. and um, you know, that would be another part of giving back to the community is just always having that kind of, um, you know, partnership and giving back. So the plan, how are we doing? I got a minute and 33 seconds. Goals and objectives, 30, 60, 90, and then one year and three years. So 30 days to the end of the year, have all my legal startup complete, put up the website, create that Signet Leadership LinkedIn presence. Within 60 days, create an online marketing plan and begin that online posting and video. So as I said, I'm a planner. I want a calendar that says, here I'm gonna be doing a post, here I'm gonna be doing a video, when am I creating the content and stick to it because that's how you build consistency and credibility online. 
and I'd start looking for speaking opportunities and planning that first leadership live event. Within 90 days, I will, you know, be looking and leveraging the network for client engagements and starting to build that online presence with those posts. One year, hope to have one to three completed client consults or, and or mentoring, complete the first leadership live event, and hope that that online brand uh, is growing and have some metrics around that. I've actually, on December 18th, have booked with uh, a marketing specialist, an online marketing um, specialist who worked at Disney and things like that. Time to go through marketing plan and I've you know already started building that out. Within three years, I want the business earning consistent net profit. So maybe it's only a dollar, but if I don't hit something by three years, I need to seriously reevaluate what I'm doing. And if I think you know within the next two, if I just, I'm going to do that. Financial model, but um, what I did is I said, what's my dollar revenue uh, model? So for every one dollar, I'm going to put 15 cents right away into my tax account. My tax account is separate from my regular operating because I don't ever want to be in that situation where my quarterly taxes come up and I'm scrambling on my personal credit card or something horrible. Five to 10 percent profit, a 45 percent opex a 30, 35% salary. Obviously, salary may be non-existent for a while. That's okay. OPEX might be 65%. Okay. But at least I have some kind of plan for every dollar that comes in. Pricing, an hourly rate. I do have a target. Includes my OPEX costs, my, my taxes like self-employment, and my base fee. And of course, I have a consulting background. So I know I need to add a little bit for expenses if I incur any of those to flow through to the client. Resource requirements are very small, it's initially me. I do have a CPA who's amazing that I want to use eventually when I can afford him and probably a virtual assistant to help with some of this logistics and booking and things like that. Technology, also super simple. Definitely need a new quality headset and an iPhone that's, you know, not the iPhone 4 that I have. So that's in a nutshell, Signet Leadership, some of the high levels. Um, you know, hopefully it hits some of the key points. Feedback, comments, suggestions are welcome. Thank you. Great job, Jeffrey. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, there's a couple things, um, you know, with the, um, what you were talking about, about the, uh, I can't remember which, which um, kind of forum you're using this for, but for the, for the talks that you're doing. Um, I've always found, um, you know, so Dr. Angie and I, we both do leadership coaching as well. And to your point, people, you know, you can go up all day and you can talk about all these other things that I do as a strong leader and successful and blah, 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 blah. And I've mm -hmm. noticed that that's when audiences start to tune out. Mm -hmm. Um, when people talk about, this is when I first started in leadership and this is where I failed miserably, but mm -hmm. here's what I did. And here's what it. And you still know that this person has been successful. So it shows, you know, the humility, a true story, genuine, authentic, and all of that. So mm -hmm. I just took a note that, you know, I really like that because I think if you go down that pathway, then people are really going to gravitate, you know, to you and to the people that you bring in to do those, those types of talks. Um, okay. So I'm really glad you keyed in on that. The other thing too is um, that I, that I really like about the model is you know, like you said, look, you know, people, whenever they say leadership coaches, everybody's like, oh, you can throw a rock and hit one. Well, I've, I've seen that, you know, ones that are really successful hone in on, on an area. And, you know, I think you did that with your, with your background that you have and kind of your personality that you have and your experiences that you have. The thing that stuck out to me was um, kind of that niche maybe where you have the subject matter expert going into management, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of general uh, leadership coaches, we know like the nuances of going from an individual contributor to leadership, mm -hmm. but you added, I think this piece of, at least what I heard was kind of somebody coming from like an analytical background mm -hmm. or maybe a STEM background or something that was a little right. more engineering background or something like that, mm -hmm. right? Well, mm -hmm. if you think about our backyard, and the people that you have in this area, that could be a gold mine, you know, for individuals, because 
it's one thing to go from individual contributor and maybe you were in the marketing department or some other department, right? Mm -hmm. you're just learning the nuances of leadership. It's another thing to go from this type of high specialty mm -hmm. into managing and maybe not even managing people that are like you, right? You're like, maybe you're not going from engineering <laughs> to manage engineers, right? You might be going from engineering to manage, you know, something differently. So those are just a couple of things that stuck out to me that I think, you know, that, would would that really help you stand out there okay thank you actually um great job uh, Catherine. i think you did a wonderful job of uh, clarifying what you're doing your plan looks solid to me uh frankly you've considered a lot of points i echo jay's point around you know you talk about the funnel i'm assuming you're talking about the sales funnel and that pain point i would encourage you to be real clear about what problem are you solving and hone that because you have such a broad, diverse background um, to narrow and launch yourself in a particular specialization that you can now build upon. I love Jay's advice to you around the technical background that you have. That is a unique um, skill set uh, for a consultant. And then, of mm -hmm. course, when you start talking lean and some of that Six Sigma background that you have, that alone can really help you to carve out a niche market. And yes, there are a lot of us out here, but there's room for more. So, so jump on in. Most definitely. We can all speak for each other. That's right. I know some great consultants. Yeah. yeah so just piggyback off what Jay and Angie were, were saying about the niching. I was, I was thinking that same thought. And there's like different ways to niche. Was, one is a, a perfect example is the way what Jay described. You know, my spouse is a physician who transitioned from clinical mm. practice to non-clinical to a non-clinical oh, wow. career. And so now coaching physicians who are making that transition and the business mm. is outstanding. So sometimes <laughs> we're fearful when we're niching, thinking mm -hmm. we're not we're gonna we're gonna leave some money on the table. But oftentimes when we do that and our message becomes really clear and we become really good at that, at solving that particular problem, then the, the business just takes care of itself. So there's that kind of functional, like Jay was describing when a, an SME is moving into leadership. Mm -hmm. There are other ways too, just to, uh, in, in terms of pain points, it could be you know, leaders who are suffering from the imposter syndrome or, or dealing with self-confidence issues or leaders who are having difficulty organizing or following through or dealing with stress, yeah. anxiety, or staying inspired about the business, avoiding, you know, avoiding burnout. So I think right. it's really powerful for you to kind of, you know, leverage um, all of your experience and skill and like nail that one particular pain point, you know? I love it. Thank you for that. And the uh, the other thing that people have said is, you know, it's great to have somebody who's not in my organization or it's not like my uncle, because if it's somebody in your organization, they can always have their own agenda. And also you're only doing as good. But if you have a more of a relationship where there's structure and accountability and it's a, a bit more professional and there's objectivity, I've heard that that's a good thing as well. Would you agree? Oh, yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And okay. Catherine, I'd, I'd offer you this. I, I, as reviewing your, looking at your plan, I assume that for some time you'll be the consultant in your business. Is mm -hmm. that, okay. All right. Um, my, my experience in a similar market, you, you, people will hire you and, and contract you more out of relationship. Mm. than an understanding of how good you are or how many, how broad your capabilities are. Right. And that's what will help you be consistently successful. So as you look and execute your marketing plan, I would um, offer you the perspective that you want it to help you develop relationship with the people in your markets. Right. And relationships are not developed based on merit. Mm -hmm. That's just not the way we operate as human beings. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'd, I'd offer you that perspective. I think you got a, a good marketing plan. The thing I'm trying to impact with my comments is what the emphasis 
and the intended outcome of the marketing is. Right. That's a great point. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Okay. So, great job. Thank you. Uh, and last but not least, we have Edwin Davis with Science Happens for Me. The Science Happens for Me. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Science Happens for Me is a nonprofit company. Okay. So Science Happens for Me is designed to enhance the learning potential of low-income, rural, and high-functioning special needs students with particular scientific skills needed for the 21st century company that enable the students to complete and obtain employable skills in STEM-based careers. Science Happens to Me offers STEM-based activities for programs for underserved, minority, and disadvantaged students living within the Research Triangle area and surrounding areas of North Carolina. Science Happens to Me offers summer programs for girls in STEM and a basic boot camp for boys in robotics throughout the school year. The business of Science Happens to Me originated from the need of low-income students to be exposed to STEM-based activities and, and potentially seeking a STEM-based career. Science Happens to Me provides middle school and high school age students with energetic and exciting STEM activities in the fields of math, science, and technology. The company began with the intentions of narrowing the STEM achievement gap for disadvantaged students living in the surrounding areas of North Carolina. So the board, the structure of the company, I'm the STEM director, I have an executive director. PBL stands for project-based learning. I have a lead teacher, a treasurer, secretary, junior engineer, student workers. I have four board members and I have a spiritual advisor. So that's the structure of the company itself. Now, what I did not do, I didn't tell you about myself. I'm a 17 year chemist. I've been teaching high school public school for 17 years and I've had many um, different associations with other companies and I teach at NC State as, as an adjunct professor on occasion. So some of the strengths about the company itself, we have a unique teaching curriculum. We deal with STEM and project-based learning. So I always tell my staff, we teach the unteachable. We work with the students who have an interest in science, but may have some other issues that you know, people want to deal with, all right? We have an affordable learning program for kids and students, local community and nonprofit organizations we've collaborated with over the past. We have a small competitive market competition. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. We have a large student workforce and apprenticeship. So what I do as, a, as a, the STEM-based director, I teach the students skills and I also mentor them and I work with them to teach them skills so they can actually work in the fields that they, they choose. Uh, marketable products, we've, I've designed over 600 experiments for home-based STEM kits. Most of the kids that we work with don't have the financial resources, but they have an awesome outdoor network. So we work with kids and show them how to do STEM with their local surroundings, okay? Um, Local community support, we look for churches, nonprofits, local business owners, potential for growth and expansion. We've collaborated, we look for collaborations and partnerships. Some of the weaknesses um, is our adult volunteers and students. Our organizations, we look for volunteers to help us with many of our things to cut our costs, accessibility to funding source, uh, paying clients versus grant funding, the STEM material and shipping costs. Uh, that's a pretty good expense for the company itself student clients, low income students versus regular students. So one of the cost structures that we designed is that for every regular student that pays normal admission to whatever we charge, it should subsidize the student who doesn't have the resources to attend our program. We offer STEM training, one of the weaknesses is STEM training protocols and safety measures. I have to train a lot of the people who are not necessarily scientists to help me do the experience with great accuracy so they can help the students understand you know, different topics in biology, chemistry, physics, and things that we're doing. Um, Weakness is getting board members, getting board members to uh, donate either time or resources and making a, a yearly commitment for to stay on with organization. Marketing budget is, is also weakness and multimedia presence. So we're trying to develop Instagram, um, Twitter, and the other social media feeds. Okay, some of the opportunities that we have, we're, we have a local STEM camp that's gonna occur in 2021 um, from Burroughs Welcome. Um, it was well received in 2020, but it was canceled because of COVID. So this is a year long program that will include the summer and also weekend workshops for kids learning STEM. And we're in collaboration with North, North Carolina um, State University on this, this uh, grant. We have a partnership with local elementary school in, in Nightdale. We have a program partnership with North Carolina State University. That's the MSN pre-college program. We have a partnership with the local 
nonprofit group, Communities and Schools of Wake County. I've worked with them for over seven years, um, doing the students at the Duke Energy um, Community Center or the Kenwood Community Center. And we've been approached to develop a partnership with the teaching program and outreach with the Goodnight Fellows Program. These are college students who are in STEM-based fields who look back, who look to give their time and energy back to the community. Okay, some of the threats as a company, lack of diversified funding sources, that's, that includes fund foundations, grants from foundations, local and federal sources, operation capital, STEM programs. You know, we offer a lot of programs, but um, sometimes the people that we offer the services to are difficult having, being able to pay for the program. Building rental, community um, equipment, availability for STEM kits, business credit. The business has only been in existence for a year and a half, so we're, we're still a brand new business. Um, liability insurance, mobility of the business travel, being able to take the STEM kits that I have and equipment, being able to share that and have other people take it across without using their personal vehicles and our, our taxes, UBIT taxes and charity registration license. Right. So some of our competition, our competition typically includes a variety. These are people that I've researched that. And typically what happens is they all have a session for maybe three or four days in a week and they'll charge $125 a week. Um, that's for STEM for kids. Mad Science have actually worked for their, their program. They charge $145 weekly and they're only a three hour session. Compared to what we do, we'll have a week long session and the students comes for a whole week for $25. So we have a little bit more desirable things and we teach the same content. The only difference is they have more resources in terms of being established with STEM equipment. So we have a variety of um, competition out there in the STEM field. All right. So I broke it down to show you, this is our actual income for the 2020 season. Um, so we, had a, we, had, we did have an income, we received two grants, um, our STEM services, basically, these are the services that we gave to, this, to the general public. This is what they paid, okay? Um, and then this is the, these are our expenses, okay? So I listened to Jay and I made one simple slide, the next slide. So net income, net expenses, and the gross profit. Now, most times you'll say, well, you're operating at negative cost. Um, that's true because some nonprofits going getting started is difficult and they do operate at a negative cost. However, you know, we were able to secure some funding and do a few programs this year, even during COVID. So we do have another budget projection that is a little more positive as we learn from this seminar that we've been taking, how to look at different things, okay? All right, so this is my last slide. And what I did was I tried to stick to the 12 slides so I can get information in. I looked at what we're gonna do for 90 days from today. We're gonna update our business website. We're going to update the social media platforms. And I have people who are volunteering now to help me do this and get some students who are very knowledgeable about it. We're going to advertise for our summer camp, which is the all girls STEM camp, complete our taxes. So these are just some of the things that we do. Um, and I do have a one year and three year plan, but I just tried to scale it down to give you an overview of what the company was about. Okay. And I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm open for any questions, details that you would like to know. Yeah, Edwin, again, I think um, we, your, your plan gives us a good understanding of the business. Uh, the observation I have <clears throat> is that you notice in the other business plans, they had client acquisition strategies or client acquisition plans. And that's because the income that would support the business would come from clients. Mm -hmm. The counterpart in your plan would be a grant or donor acquisition strategy. Um, and it really was uh, kind of clear when you showed your organizational structure is there wasn't a block for that critical function in your business and as a nonprofit business, um, either grant acquisition or donor acquisition is is absolutely critical because that's what will provide the income to the business so that you can deliver your services to your intended market okay there there was a couple of comments slash questions um, one is great concept love teaching stem to preschoolers i would like more information on why the boot camps are gender specific Typically, when we look at STEM careers, we have a large underserved population of girls who are just really interested, but they don't get they don't get exposure to the high level math and science. 
And then with young boys, they have a lot of energy. So, and if I'm going to teach them STEM, I'm not, they're going to be energetic. So the boot camp is designed to give them calisthenics to help refocus their mind and their energy into doing an activity, then go back to doing the science and the math. And they're not necessarily, well, the agenda specifically because when I go out to the community centers, this is what I, these are my clients that I really see. And these are the students that I see. Like, for example, at um, Kentwood Community Center, there's a predominantly young set of young boys there. So when I'm teaching activities to them, I kind of kind of cater some of the activities to help them focus on things versus some of the other things. It, it wasn't meant, I guess, to say separate, it's just that I just wanted to be sure that I, I cover all the bases for the students. Love that. And sounds like reaching back and creating some opportunity for the underserved. And we know um, it's a fact, whether we like it or not, that girls uh, tend to pursue STEM way less than, than males. So great job there. There is a question. I was curious about this too. You had the liability insurance considered a threat. Um, so someone wanted to know, uh, why did you consider that? You know, when I when I look at getting liability for the, it's just the company itself, we do have it. There was a lot of questions on that being a new company. You know, like for example, renting a building. You know, tripping and falling. They were they were just nervous about giving me the insurance. So I looked at it as a threat because I may not have been able to get it, and, and I didn't know why. I, they just you know were very cautious about it. And then someone wanted to know what are the ages again for your market, the target market? I, I go from fifth grade to 12th grade. And I don't know what ages grades are because students look differently, but I would probably say from nine to 19. Okay. And then um, you have a testimonial here. Um, Mr. Davis is a great science teacher. My daughter had the opportunity to attend his class several times in Smart Academy and pre-MSEN program at NCSU. Thanks a lot. That's from yeah. Catherine Wang. Oh, okay. So I've been doing science for a long time. You know, I, I just want to say that this, this program has helped me a lot. Um, when I submitted my, my, my slide deck, it was 45 slides. So I had to kind of <laughs> scale it down some. Yeah, you, so, you know Bill Davis was not having that. I understand. So <laughs> I, 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 did, I did have information that you asked me for, but, I, but I, I just want to thank you for so much information that you have provided for me and my team. And, um, so thank you. I want to say that um, I think your plan is clear and concise. I think that Bill gave you some really solid um, guidance there. Um, how can you get some more long-term sustainable um, revenue coming in? Yes. Um, and I appreciate that your competitors may offer less and charge more, but how can we get you charging more and getting someone to help uh, pay that so that you can reach to have a greater reach, et cetera, is something that stood out to me, but great job. Thank you so much. Yeah, one of the um, things, I I, I, oh, sorry, Darlene, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to uh, commend you, uh, Edwin Davis, and, and also to share that I had the um, uh, awesome opportunity to be one of his speakers at his program that he had over the summer. And I will tell you that it was well worth more than what the students paid. The information that they were getting was so invaluable that I agree with Dr. Angie. What, what is the way that we can get him to charge more for the information that's being disseminated? He not only had students that were in house but he also had students that were via Zoom. So he, he was able to facilitate those who came in live and also those who were watching via Zoom and they were all able to participate in this program that was a week long program. And it was, it was packed full of information. And I believe it was well worth every penny that they paid and then some. So I'm, I'm in agreement. We've got to be looking for ways of having people invest in this, especially when you have um, students that are female students who don't always, you know, get recognition for being a part of STEM. Those are the ones we're looking for. Those are the ones we're after. And so we want to make sure that we can provide finances for them to get what they need, especially during those formative years. 
Now, I'd like to just chime in and say maybe some of these testimonies would be good in some of the marketing you do because mm -hmm. you've certainly received outstanding testimony. Mm -hmm. I, I will follow that up. Yeah. The other thing I was going to say is uh, I think, you know, all of us are just honing in on, on additional revenue for you. So I know that, um, um, that in SCORE, there's an individual that's working on uh, kind of sourcing and highlighting minority grants. Um, so that's something that, that, you know, I would stay close to SCORE on because um, that might be uh, something else that you, can, that you can do in addition to, um, you know, your nonprofit looking for sponsorships and things like that. So okay. right and I'm right there. I'm going to make Bill's day because I, I know this is a place that he comes from. Um, we cannot, as, as, as minority business owners, we cannot be afraid to charge a fair market fee for the value of the work that we're doing. And when you think about your experience, your knowledge, your education, your track record, these testimonials, I would just question, is there a limiting belief that you may be working on that are, are operating in that you may need to shift because it sounds like what you're doing is invaluable. I'm quite impressed with that. So uh, I think what we're saying is charge more money. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, Dr. Cheryl Kirk Dugan is in your corner. She's clapping, saying <laughs> you need to charge more money. 17 years of uh, information, 17 years of training, 17 years of pouring into not only students that you had, but other students. And I've seen, I've seen you in action. You, she's, he's also participated with um, women's empowerment. They had a, a section where they were actually doing scientific experiments and I'll never forget I learned how to do a science experiment with bubble gum okay so <laughs> it's, it's amazing the things that that we can do and and we I, I really believe that um we've got to look for those the the funding and finances okay. I, to and be I'm able sorry. to go ahead I'm sorry no, no, go ahead, Bill. I know you're-, you're I'm, gonna, I'm gonna continue to emphasize that uh, the critical factor for, the, for your, the success of your business as a nonprofit is grants and donors. Those credentials that you have, which are extraordinary, is the information that would go into the grant request, okay? Um, because no matter how much you charge your clients, I mean, charge the people you serve, given the market that you've chosen, which is a fabulous market, it'll never produce enough income to support the program. That's why you're a nonprofit. That's why you need grants and donations. And you, you have to go after them, you know? And so you create the capability like a for-profit creates a sales force. A non-for-profit creates a grant writing donor management function in that business to get that income into the business. Yep. I told you he would get you straight. He was, he was on edge uh, to tell you, and that is great feedback. And I would just add that I noticed you had listed Duke Energy. Uh, Duke Energy does have a foundation um, that supports the type of work you're doing. And I highly recommend that you reach out to them um, just by going on their web, their website. Yeah. Well, to, to your point, Dr. Angie, this fiscal year, we wrote 35 grants. We received five other grants for a total of $15,300. And Duke Energy was one that said, uh, they couldn't support me now, but to Mr. Bill's point, I need to diversify and get a little bit more information. So now I know how to reapproach the application and put some information here that would make me a more accessible for an award. That's Wonderful. great. Yeah. And a couple other recommendations, Edwin, if you look in the chat here, um, Dove Soap and some other organizations that, that um, you, you know, might, might be an option for you. But um, well, I just, that was the last presentation. I just want to say, first of all, I really appreciate everybody who presented tonight. Um, you know, I think you guys did a great job. Um, lots of, lots of courage, lots of, lots of passion. 
And, um, you know, it was tough because we had a lot of people that, that applied um, or to present and um, we couldn't accommodate everybody. You know, we're almost out of time al already, um, but uh, great job tonight. Um, Patty, is there anything that uh, you want to add to the evening or anybody else that um, I, I, I can't see right now? I can't well, see. Well, I would, I would just also okay. like to congratulate everyone on what they did tonight. They put their presentations together. We communicated back and forth and, and they all did a wonderful job. Dr. Angie, do you have any information on the survey for us tonight? I don't. Um... I dropped the ball, to be honest. Um, let me circle back and get that link um, out. I'll circle back in the morning. Okay, so we do have one more week, you all. And next week, we'll come back together and kind of tie everything together. We're going to have certificates for you all. And uh, we do want you to fill out the survey when it's complete so that we have accurate documentation as to what you learned in the program and and we want to do something in the future. This will not be the last program that we're going to do. We're looking to do maybe two to three programs next year that will be probably in the four week range. The team is going to continue to meet probably on a monthly basis to work out what the program is going to be. And we will come back and you all will be our target audience to come and we'll start teaching you other things like we may do marketing or you know, professionalism in business. There's many topics that we're looking at that we think would be very helpful to just start to hone in and fine tune what you're doing as a business owner. So we're, we're not leaving you all for good. We're gonna go away for a while and work on something for you and we will come back. Absolutely. Dr. Wood, do you have any comments tonight? I was just impressed by the innovation of each presenter. It's, it really speaks a lot to the series and also to the type of people who've been attending. And I can't wait to see how these businesses or organizations do in the future. But certainly I see value. I, I wasn't that optimistic at first because I figured, well, you know, it, it, it's hard to present. A lot of people, it takes a lot, but those presentations were good and the concepts were amazing. And I, again, thank each of you for all that you've done, the participants and those who have been presenting in the weeks that have gone by. Thank you all. I do, thank you, Dr. Wood. I do have a question um, that I think is worth us taking a minute to address. Um, the question is, what is our experience worth? A lot of us are afraid to ask for the money. Um, Bill, would you take that please? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to take it in a general, in a general way. Number, number one, what, when you bring products and services to the market, you, you don't know. So you ought to bring it to the market experimentally. The other thing to understand is a, is a client or a customer will never volunteer to pay more than you ask. So you ought to go to the market with the intention of a, with a price, with the intention of somebody telling you, no, I, I won't pay that. Um, and not because they can't afford it. You want them to say, no, I won't pay that because I don't think it's worth that. Then you know your price that you're offering is too high and you adjust accordingly. And I say that because the businesses that we're in are all different. So it isn't like, I mean, you can go some places and get an idea, but if you're offering coaching, consulting, new unique new services, there it's hard to have a reference point. You just gotta be willing to be told that's too much. You know, we, we tend to operate like the person I'm gonna quote this price to is the only customer I'm gonna have. So they've gotta say yes. Well, the reality is, one customer will never make your business. You're going to have numbers of opportunities. And what you don't want to do is leave money on the table. And the only way you don't leave money on the table is to risk somebody saying, I don't think what you're offering is worth that. And then the next person that you offer it to, or you come back to them with a counteroffer. 
but don't be afraid to have somebody tell you no, or you'll never get to your optimum price. And the market thinks more of you than you think of yourself. That's the other thing I will say, it's just human nature. And one will say no, and someone else will say yes to the same price. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, and the one more thing I wanted to mention, because I run into this sometimes with my clients too, when we have conversations around pricing for their businesses is because somebody says no, doesn't devalue your offer. Right. It just means that they're either not the right person or it's not the right price point. But it doesn't mean what you have to offer is not valuable. Sometimes yeah. we make we connect those two, right, Bill? We say, well, if yeah. they said no, that must mean what I have is not valuable. To, to your point, Sharon, there are two kind of no's. One no is I can't afford it. Yeah. The other no is it's not, I don't think it's it's worth worth it. Mm -hmm. When somebody tells you no on your price, you need to you need to find out which they're saying no about. Right, right. Because what you do when they can't afford it is very different than what you do if they don't think it's worth it. Right. And they're talking about your service; they're not talking about you. To Sharon, to Sharon's point, they can go, "No, nah, that ain't worth it." That doesn't mean that you're not worth it. Right. Okay. They're buying your service; they're not buying you. <laughs> You know, the one thing I would say is if, if they say it's not worth it and, you know, as, and maybe this is kind of where I come from as a consultant, sometimes I'll go back and think, especially if I know that they truly do need what, <laughs> what the offer was is I'll, I'll assess how my approach, I mean, I always do, do a, uh, a, a postmortem, right? So was it my approach? Was it how I approached this opportunity did I push my value proposition correctly? Did I identify and articulate the problem that they're facing correctly and to the magnitude that it truly is and things like that? So one of the things I used to tell my sales folks is that when you get a no, it's an opportunity. And it's an opportunity to do that post-mortem and to learn from every single no. And that's something that personally then I carried even with myself and my own services when I was trying to figure out where to price myself, how to price my services, and I was getting a lot of no's and I can't afford or that, you know, that. And to Bill's point, you know, like I, I took it personal for a while. I started, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, and I kept looking at my resume and my experiences. And I'm like, well, I mean, you come on now. But then I didn't take it personal. I just looked at, okay, is it even the right target? And actually Bill and I talked about that, you know, the solutions that I was taking, I was going to startups with. He was like, no, you need to go to second stage, you know, with what you're doing, right? So you know, it gives you this opportunity to really kind of take a look back and make those tweaks that you need to make in your approach in your business plan. And remember, every customer isn't for you and, and they can't afford you. And that doesn't mean you diminish your value. That means that you find the customer who will buy from you at your fees or higher. And they will. That's right. Some will, some won't. So what next? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think. Hey, can I add one thing? Yes. Edwin, Edwin, would you mind putting your contact information in the chat if you wouldn't mind? Because I think I might have someone, you know, that you might appreciate meeting. So I love it. You put your contact in. Building a community, guys. We're building a community here. I, I love it. And this I'll just before before Patty closes us out, if you have not. Um, put your contact info as in a, an email associated with the name and you're planning on receiving a certificate, we will not be sending a certificate to iPhone or 919 dot, dot, dot. Um, so make sure um, you have your information if, if you haven't or you have a screen name that is nondescript. Uh, we will get that survey out to you. It is an electronic survey. It'll be brief. And when you do complete it, Yes, we love all the wonderful accolades. We appreciate them. We're very humbled by them. But if we're going to really serve you and meet your needs, we need you to be very candid about what would have worked better for you. What would you have liked to see more of? What topics you think are more important and, and pivotal to your success? Um, in the early stages of your businesses. And, and as Patty said, we'll be spending time pulling those things together. So um, 
you know, we have tough skin and, and we don't mind you giving us some constructive feedback. Because it's not personal, it's business. Absolutely. All right. Well, we look forward to seeing you all next week for our final meeting going into the holiday. You all take care and we'll be back here next Thursday at 6 p.m. To, to close out this business plan support program. Thank Very you all so much. Thank you so very much. Good night, night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Have a great evening. Up next, our final session together in this 13-week business plan series. The facilitators and Dr. Lynette Wood, and others, will have final comments. Later, there will be a celebration ceremony at Patty's house, virtually of course. The final session is open for registrations, simply go to www.raleigh.score.org. Click on the tab Take a Workshop and register today. See you next week.